Good morning, everyone. They, they say we're supposed to be wearing these, but uh, I don't know, I, I, I can't see a thing. I, what, what's the point of this? So, uh, oh, may, maybe a little, little premature, but uh, hope you all have these for tomorrow, b b big events, so. Uh, good to see all of you here. If the uh, la ladies in the back would pass out the attendance pads, we'll get things rolling. A few announcements to kick off our day. Uh, the children's ministry meeting will be this Thursday the 11th at 6.30 p.m. and I believe that's going to be in the library. Seniors on the go, you have your uh, luncheon on Tuesday. Uh, please sign on the kiosk out in the front so we can have an accurate count and have enough food for everybody. Uh, it's going to be a program from the uh, Senior Center on the uh, Hendricks County Best Kept Secrets. So we all like to find out what the best kept secrets are, so hope you'll all be attending that. And the Women in Ministry will have their meeting on Saturday the 13th at 9.30. So uh, all of you that are interested in attending that, please uh, put that on your calendars as well. Uh, the youth will be selling candles for their mission trip. The kids will have order forms, so see one of them today. Uh, order your candles, and next week there will be a sign-up uh, table in the lobby, but if you want to uh, reward your favorite youth, uh, try and see them today. There is uh, some benefit for them to uh, raise money for their mission trip, and they'll get credit individually if you uh, sign up with them uh, directly. Uh, looks like the orders will be taken through the 21st and then be delivered there shortly after. So, with that, let us prepare for our service today. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Spirit and truth, those are the worshipers our God desires. But how? We are not capable without his help. Come, Holy Spirit, and lead us in worship. Come, Holy Spirit, and lead us in worship.
Let us pray. Our Father, after Easter Sunday, it is easy to feel a little let down. Help us, Lord. Help us experience your presence today. Help us draw close to your mercy seat. Help us draw each other into deeper walk with you. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts bring a smile to your face. Christ is risen indeed. Amen.
Amen. Before I jump into prayer time, I want to remind you that what Glenda just shared with us, you can do the same thing. Now, you may think, well, I don't sing. That's okay. Or I don't play an instrument. We have a pretty adept pianist who will work with you. Or if you'd rather have a guitarist behind you, I know a pretty lame guitarist that will work with you. But you don't have to do music. If you'd rather read a poem or read a, a little bit of an essay, something like that, I've seen that done very powerfully as a special. So don't think of it as special music. Think of it as special. It's a special offering that you give that helps the rest of us draw in to the throne room of God. If you'd like to help with that, Lori Christie, Scott's wife, uh, is the one who's kind of heading up that group. So if you're interested, contact Lori and we'll get you on that list and, and worked into, uh, it's not really a rotation, but we'll get you into that rotation for lack of a better term. All right, church, let's practice. Lord in your mercy. All right, I think we're getting this down now. Let's, let's join our hearts together and pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are grateful for a beautiful spring morning to remind us that the cold of winter is moving away and the beauty and the warmth of summer is coming. We know it's no accident that Easter is this time of year to remind us that the dark and cold of our sin is passing away. That the grace and warmth of your son Jesus and his sacrifice and his resurrection are here. Help us to not only embrace that sacrifice and that resurrection, help us to wallow in it. Until we stink of him, till we look like him, till we talk like him, till we make decisions like him, then we know, God, you're not done with us until those things are true. So continue to work in us. We come this morning with our first priority to bring your name, honor, and glory. We lift up the name of Jesus so that all men and women would be drawn to him. Help us to do that, God. You know whatever words and things we have to say are inferior, but empowered with your Holy Spirit, they become more than sufficient. So God, empower us. Send your Holy Spirit to infuse not just our words, not just our, our smiles and our actions, but our very selves. Infuse us with your presence. Help us to expect and to look for your movement. And then help us have eyes to see it. As we come, we acknowledge there are many things on our plates, many things on our minds and hearts that threaten <clears throat> to pull us away from you. So God, we pray as we lift up these concerns and these joys to you, that you keep Paul's words ever mindful in front of us. Worry less, pray more. God, I lift to you the community and all who may be in the path of this eclipse. Uh, you know what's going to happen, but we don't. You know what kind of gridlock we're going to experience, but, but we don't. You know what kind of relief and opportunities will present themselves to us, but we don't. So God, prepare us. Prepare us for what we might experience, but also prepare us to speak your truth and to bring your hope to people who are desperate for it. As this area floods with people from outside of this area, give us opportunities to plant the seeds of your gospel so that it spreads as they return home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I thank you for safe travel for my dad for this weekend. I pray you'd give him safe travel back home today. <clears throat> pray for Isaiah's travel to Terre Haute and back today. Lord, we pray that all that, all that happens would be in keeping with your will. We know we live in a sinful world and things happen that are not your will. We pray that none of that happens, that your will would be done 
here on earth just as it is in heaven without any hesitation, without any resistance, without any variance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, I pray that you would continue listening actively as your people cry out to you. Hear our prayer. Lord, I have a praise this morning. My granddaughter telephoned me yesterday and said that she has completed all of her tests for completion of her master's degree in biology. Um, so proud, such a praise. There was so much going on in the world. There are good kids. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 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 <laughs> Father, I thank you for the church gathered and praying together. Your word says that where two or more are gathered, you're there. Your word also says where two or more agree in prayer, you will answer. <clears throat> so God, we pray for the answers to these prayers. So much wrong in our society, God, that it can be overwhelming. Thank you for those who are attempting to make a difference and to make changes for the better. Help them and help us to recognize that oftentimes the answer begins with the simple. We celebrate that simple as we celebrate our submission to you with the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If the kiddos will come forward. I don't know if you all can hear this or not, but when we do the Lord's Prayer, there is a child's voice over here that knows every word and says it loud. Is there anything? Oh, that better? we would all have that same type of energy and effort as we lift our voices to the Lord. Okay, so I think I'm gonna call an audible here. I think we're gonna just do this. No, I'm good. 
Okay, guys, we're going to forget that stuff and we're going to do something different. Okay, so um, have you ever heard, oh, look, I left, my, I left my glasses behind. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, lean not on your, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your ways straight. So what does it mean if we're going to not trust our own understanding? Do we have any idea what that means? No, that's kind of hard, isn't it? Okay, here's what we're going to do. Everybody lay down, do this, make, make your little, do you know how to make binoculars? Or you make one, make one binocular. Now get down real low. Get down real low and look out there into the, into the congregation. Look out there and tell me what you see. Look out there, lay down. Heck yeah, get down low. What do you see? What are you seeing? You see your mom? Excellent. Let's, you do? She seems really far away, doesn't she? Yeah. Rowan, what do you see? No? I see a lot of shoes. I see shoes. I see feet. There's some cute shoes. Okay, now let's stand up. Okay, now tell me what you see. What do you see? You can't. Oh, and I see, I see Remy out there. And now I can see faces. Look at those heads and faces. Okay, now come up here. Come up here. Come here. Oh, my goodness. Did you know there was something up top? <gasps> look, you can see all the way up top now. Chase, look. Look I at those people up there. You can. You know what? No matter where we go, we can always see our moms. That's fabulous, isn't it? Oh, there's a clock up there. I didn't see that before. What? You know what? Oh, right up, see, what? Right, right up on that wall back there. Oh, and there's a blinking red light. Oh, maybe you guys can't see it. I'm a little bit taller, so I can see a blinking red light. See, when we, when we get up higher, Jet, can you see up there? Can you see Grandpa? There's Grandpa up there. What, well, he's see, up there? When, when we're up in a different place, we can see different things, can't we? Now, yeah, imagine... I I know. You can see rainbows when you have the right perspective. You guys can't see what we see. Do you think your mom can see what we see? Mom, can you see me? <laughs> she can see you. Do you think she can see? Mom, can you see the blinking red light up there? It's, can... up, it's way too high. Yeah, she can't it's see that high. one, can she? Because we, can, we have a different perspective. Perspective. This is called perspective. We can see things differently. Now, yeah. now, Pastor Chris is pretty smart, isn't he? Is Pastor Chris pretty yeah, smart? Yeah, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> Zane, but who's smarter, Pastor Chris or God? God? Because Pastor Chris has learned a lot of things, but he doesn't know as much as God, does he? And, and you're pretty smart. You know a lot of things, but you don't know as much as God, do you? So you can see down here, but you can't see up here. So that's when we say, when we say, oh, we're not going to jump down. When we say, trust, don't trust here, don't trust here. This, is, this, this doesn't see everything. We have to trust up here, right? So we don't trust our own brains. We trust, yeah, because he can see things that we can't see. And he's really, really smart. Well, we're not going to jump down. Are you ready to go to children's church, though? Yeah. Okay, let's say our prayer. Turn around. Look at me. Hands out, hands together, eyes closed, heads bowed. Dear God, thank you so much for helping us see what you see. Help us to remember to rely on your brain and not ours, because we can't see everything. In your name we pray, amen. Now let's walk back up. No, feet step, step, step. Good job, bud.
The gospel is written in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. The house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim to me, having in his hand a burning coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Scott. For those of you that have your Bible with you, I'll tell you we're going to spend a little bit of time on this Isaiah passage, but you may want to put a finger on Luke chapter 5, because that's where we'll probably spend most of our time today. Like my shirt, by the way? <laughs> I want to start by talking to all the drivers in the room. How many of you are drivers? I want to paint a scene that there's a driver in front of you, you're on the interstate, and the guy realizes he's about to miss his exit. What should that driver do? Say it real loud, Elliot. Drive to the next exit and double back. That's what every driver instructor in the world would tell you to do. What do they do? Some of you may watch Jimmy Fallon on The Tonight Show. I've submitted a few jokes here and there. He has used one. It was hashtags. I forget what the hashtag was. There ought to be or something like that. And what I submitted was, there ought to be a third turn signal that indicates I'm about to do something stupid. <laughs> because that's what we do. We see that exit, oh my goodness, I'm almost at the exit, so whoop, right past three lanes of traffic, it doesn't matter what's behind you or next to you, i got to get on that exit, right? Now, we would never do that. It's those other people, right? Why is that a bad decision? Yeah? You could run into other cars. But you know, I've done that several times. I've never hit anybody. Is this still a bad decision? Why? Yeah? You're saying that I made a dumb decision? Man, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> How does that decision impact the drivers around you? It's really unexpected, isn't it? You've been the driver that it's been done to, and all of a sudden somebody does something stupid, and, and you're right, Big G, it is, it is stupid when I do that. And it's stupid because it's unexpected to all the drivers. You know, that's why we have turn signals. You're supposed to signal before you brake. I think our culture's lost that, but the signal is an indication I'm about to brake and then I'm going to turn. It's, it's so that there's nothing unexpected, because the unexpected often leads to really, really bad results. But in our, our passage in Luke, we'll find out that the unexpected can sometimes be a good thing. It will always freak us out nonetheless. Right? 
The unexpected is always going to freak us out for many reasons. One of them is it reminds us we're not in control of everything. And we don't like that. Okay, I don't like that. I'll put it on me and not necessarily you. The unexpected is particularly difficult for some. <clears throat> Our Hannah uh, does not accept unexpected very well. Maybe it's her disability, maybe it's her personality. It's probably some conglomeration of those two together. But she does not deal with life's unexpected changes very well. And I remember one night when we were living in Lawrenceburg. Lawrenceburg, if you don't know it, is just barely not Cincinnati. And we had gone over to Cincinnati to eat, and we were on our way home, and we were on the interstate on the bypass around Cincinnati, and as we approached our exit at Lawrenceburg, I noticed the cars were backed up. And I unexpectedly immediately swerved into the, to the, the shoulder and stopped. Came to a, and you talk about freaking people out. I got three other people in the vehicle, and they're all three looking at their phone. And suddenly the car jerks and comes to a complete stop. But they didn't see what I saw. Because what I saw was stopped traffic in front. And behind me, I saw a guy who had no time to stop. And did not look like he even realized he needed to. So I swerved over and it gave him time to react, but not enough. Because he slammed into the car in front of us just on one side. Had I not moved, he would have slammed into us without breaking flat, flat against us. No turn, no swerve, no slowdown. We drove away from that accident, unharmed, a little shaken, without injury or damage. And it was because the driver was the best driver on the road. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's because the driver had vision that the rest of the passengers did not have. They were thankful after they realized what I had done and why, but when I did it, it freaked them out because those types of unexpected changes freak people out, right? But sometimes the unexpected can be good. So this passage in Isaiah is kind of our background um, so just to set that stage, what's going on in that passage? Non-rhetorical. Maybe we need to read the Old Testament more. Isaiah sees a vision. What's God doing in that vision? I'll give you a hint. We just sung a song about it. God is calling Isaiah into ministry. He's calling him to be his prophet. He's calling him to speak to God's people on his behalf. Now, I can tell you that's an intimidating call. It's one you don't say yes to lightly, and most people don't say yes to it immediately. Their first reaction is the same as Isaiah's, and what was that reaction? Oh, no, 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 not me. You must, have, you must have your finger pointed the wrong way. You got the wrong dude. Maybe I should step over and let somebody else step in there. Isaiah says, nuh-uh. How often has God told you and me to do something, called us to do something, and we've told him, nuh-uh? Now, we may not be bold enough to say it out loud, but our actions show it. I won't tell people what God's telling me to do because I don't want them to know that I'm telling him no. We tell God no all the time. We just don't use the words. Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King Yahweh Sabaoth. Yahweh Sabaoth, by the way, is just a title that means Yahweh is the commander of heaven's armies. If you're not, fam if you're familiar with the uh, movie Wayne's World, this is what Isaiah is telling God: "I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not." Wor have we told God that? Oh, surely, God, you don't want me to speak for you. 
you don't want me to do that. You want somebody far better qualified from that for that. We've all told him that. Oh, I would be no good at that, God. I'm unworthy. But look at how they fix it. The, fi- the seraphim shows up, flies over to Isaiah with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and atonement is made for your sin. Thank God that we have the death and resurrection of Jesus, because I don't know about you, I do not want burning coals put on my lip. If you don't want burning coals put on your lip, tell God yes. Answer his call with, oh, 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 okay. It's okay to be tentative. But when we tell him, nuh-uh, good stuff's not going to happen. And we miss so, so much when we tell him no. All right, so we're getting into the unexpected. Oh, wait, that might be Isaiah right there. Once his lips are clean, his response is, oh, here I am, send me. I'll go, I'll do it. This is the posture we should be taking more with God than we do. Amen? Oh, 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 oh. Me, Mr. Cotter. So things happen that are unexpected. Uh, If you don't want somebody to touch your lips with burning coal this morning, then don't resist God's desire for you and His call on your life. And God does have a desire for you, and He does have a call on your life. It may be grand and humongous. He may want you to run for president because God knows we don't have very good candidates, apparently. It may be small and minuscule. He may want you to bake cookies and take them to the neighbor across the street because they're going through a hard time. What is the Holy Spirit telling you to do that you're resisting? Now, I know you probably think, oh, surely God can't use somebody like me, but that's exactly what Isaiah said. And it's exactly what Moses said. Who's to say that you aren't the next Isaiah or Moses. As you cringe at that thought, let me tell you, Isaiah and Moses both cringed at it too. Who's to say you're not next? All right, let's jump briefly to Luke chapter 5 now. If you have your Bible with you, it will not be on the screen, just the reference will be up there. Uh, but I will, I will be reading some of it. In this story... Uh, Jesus is telling a fisherman what to do. At first, he's trying to teach, and a crowd gathers around uh, the Sea of Galilee, sometimes called the Lake of Gennesaret. That's a real fun one to say real quick ten times, the, the Lake of Gennesaret. And what happens here, in, in starting in verse 1, one day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great cat crowds pressed in on him to listen to the Word of God. He noticed two empty boats on the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. So the the disciples here are working. They're on the clock. And Jesus is teaching people while they're off to the side on the clock. Verse 3, stepping into the one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, that's Peter by the way, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. See, this is a, a picture of of the Sea of Galilee, and as you look at it, you can notice that it kind of curves around, and there's a mountainous region behind, so more than likely, the crowd was gathering on this, I guess that's the right side, in that little plain in between the mountains, which means that if you push out in the boat a little bit, you have an amphitheater that you can speak without any amplification whatsoever, and it's going to bounce off of those mountains, and everyone on that plane will be able to hear. Jesus is no dummy. He knows this. So he goes to Peter, and he says, hey, I'm going to get in your boat, and I want you to shove off just a little bit. And that's not really that shocking for Peter. He's a teacher. He's looking for a way to be able to teach. Verse 4 tells us, when he had finished speaking, He said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper 
and let down your nets to catch some fish. I know that I have the answers to every problem on the earth. If you'd just ask me. <laughs> Somebody said, oh, good. <laughs> it's a lie. Don't believe that part of it. Jesus, what was Jesus' profession? What was his trade? To the best of our knowledge, he was a carpenter. What was Peter's trade? Fisherman. So Jesus, a carpenter, is telling a fisherman to go out and how to fish. Now, I don't know if you've had tradespeople in your house, but if you're like me, when a tradesperson's in the house, it's because I can't handle it. It's above my pay grade, it's above my understanding. And I like to hang out with the tradesmen because I might learn something. You can ask John, he's been in my house. And I was with him almost every second. Because I want to pick something up, I want to learn something. I want to see what they're doing and how they approach the problem because I didn't have the knowledge to fix it myself. Maybe next time I will. Now imagine that John's fixing the plumbing in my house and I'm standing with him, and instead of watching, I start telling him how to fix it. Now, I'm sure John would be just fine with that, and he'd go on fixing it the way he knows is best, but most people would not be okay with that. If you have an electrician working on your power box, and you start telling them how to do their job, they're probably going to ask you to get out of their way, and it may not be very kindly. Peter was a fisherman. These were not kind, gentle people. A fisherman was like a tradesman of tradesmen. Rough. They had a rough life. And I'm sure when they spoke to each other, they spoke in gruff, blunt tones. And here, Jesus is telling him to go out and how to fish. And I'm sure Peter is offended by it. Now, we don't have him recorded as telling Jesus to go get lost. What we do have recorded is Simon responding in verse 5. Master, we worked hard all night, caught nothing. But I'll do as you say and go let down the nets. How often have we told God, how often have you told God, listen God, I'm really, I'm really tired and I've tried that before, it won't work. How often have you told God, you know, we've tried that in Indiana before, but it didn't work. Well, you know, we've tried that in Hendricks County, but it just didn't work here. You know, we've tried that at Bartlett Chapel, but God, it just won't work here. You just don't understand like I do. Now, we wouldn't be bold enough to tell God he doesn't understand like we do, but we do all the time. Oh, surely God can't be calling us to that because we tried that and it didn't work. Peter fished all night and caught nothing. Jesus tells him, hey, why don't you go out, drop your nets down. Oh, Lord, we've tried that. We know what we're doing. You're not a fisherman. And what happens next, verse 6, when they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish, so much that their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats to the point they were sinking from the weight. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Sound familiar? Sound like any of our responses when God calls us to do something. Friends, sometimes the unexpected is a good thing. Isaiah and Moses and Peter and you and I demonstrate that we have two problems with following the Lord. They probably both boil down to we don't want to. But here are the two basic things we don't like. And we give these excuses. We can't. Our can't is too big. 
How big is Jesus' camp? Maybe non-existent. There is nothing, you know, the old, the old question, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? And the answer is yes, and then he can lift it. We have all of these areas we've carved out, and we have told God and each other we can't do this. But I got some news for you. God never calls the church to do what they can. He always calls the church and its people to do what they can't without his help. Because his can't is non-existent. Oh, well, you know, uh, that may be true, God, but uh, I'm really unworthy. I'm a sinful person. I got too much junk in my, in my closet, and you really don't want somebody like me. And Jesus says, I call who I want to call. And if I'm calling you enough with the excuses... Your excuses have no value here because Jesus Christ does not have a can't. And he tells us in Scripture, and we see it happen over and over again, he will use whoever he sees fit to use. When that's somebody else, we say amen. When it's us, not so much. Church folk are known for being stuck. We're often stuck in the past. But what Jesus calls us to is to not live in the past or lament that it's gone. It's to to run into the future, to move into what he's calling us to be. In Luke chapter 5, verse 10, the second half, it tells us that Jesus told Simon after he had fallen down on his feet and said, go away from me because I'm a sinful man. Jesus' response was, do not fear from now on, you'll be catching people. And guess who's the expert at that? The one who's calling Peter to do it. Wouldn't it be great? To have so many people involved in the life of the church at Bartlett Chapel that our building couldn't hold them? Wouldn't that be great? You can respond to that. Wouldn't that be awesome? I looked at last week's number and I was like, wow! If we did that consistently, we need a second service. Not just one, we need it. Wouldn't it be awesome to not have room to sit all of the disciples that God brought to us. Wouldn't it be awesome if, if, if so many people in Hendricks County were coming to Christ that we didn't have enough people to teach them the first steps of the faith? Wouldn't that be an awesome problem to have? Wouldn't it be awesome that so many people were coming to Christ? You know, these things are not a pipe dream. These things are consistent with God's dream for this area and for his people in this area. Is it perhaps the problem that our can't is too big and we think ourselves unworthy? Is it possible that our resistance is hindering God's dream for us? Guilty. tell God no all the time. Now, I don't say no. I just don't do what he tells me to do. Maybe you can relate with that. Maybe you have a direct one-on-one and you need him to tell you that your excuses have no value here. Maybe you need that face-to-face like Peter had where he tells him what to do and Peter resists it and he does it anyway and Jesus shows him There's a lot of fish to be caught. A lot. Maybe our resistance is part of the problem. Luke 5, 11. As soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. The nets that they were washing beforehand, they left them. The boats, which I'm sure cost them a lot of money to build and maintain and keep in good shape, they left them. The families they had, they left them. What they had seen was so miraculous, they left everything. 
to walk with Jesus. Today, we celebrate Holy Communion. It can become ritualistic. It can be something we just go through the motions of. But I want to remind you that when the disciples arrived at what we call the Last Supper, they knew everything that would happen. They knew the script. They knew the questions that would be asked. They knew the answers that would be offered. And they knew who would ask the questions and who would offer the Because that's all part of the script of Passover. They knew everything. Everything. They knew how the night would end. They knew what was on the menu for the meal part. They knew it all until they didn't. That unexpected was very, very good for us. Jesus is behind the wheel and he can see things we can't. He has information and understanding that we can't fathom. He has all of the knowledge we have, too. Jesus Christ has nothing to learn from us. He knows what you've tried in the past and whether it worked or not. But what He knows and we don't is what the result is if we try this now. He knows the result. We don't. Maybe we're not seeing the miraculous result because we're not submitting to him. Jesus took this extremely familiar meal and did something unexpected. He provided ongoing sustenance for all believers throughout time until he returns in glory. In one meal he did that. By that point in the gospel, the disciples had learned to just go with whatever Jesus did and said. All of them but Judas. Judas said, nah -uh. As we approach this table today, let me ask what might your resistance be blocking that God wants to happen. We all have those areas. We all have those callings that we're resisting. So before we come to this table, I want to give you a period of silence to silently confess those. Identify, confess them, and repent that God might break free in our world again today. Let's be in an attitude of prayer. Amen. I know you know this, but sometimes we need to hear it. In the name of Jesus Christ, you're forgiven. Whatever it is that you've been holding in resistance to God, if you've confessed it and repented of it in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You are now freed for joyful obedience in Christ Jesus. Good news? Good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We celebrate that forgiveness as we come to this table and remember all that Jesus did while he was on earth and all that he's done in, through, and about us from heaven. We celebrate that God not only left us uh, alone, he sent the Holy Spirit to be our companion, to be our partner, to be our helper, to be our leader. How an awesome it is to be in God's family.
And on that night, Jesus provided that sustenance for us. When he raised the bread, he broke it. He told his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth food from the earth. And then after the supper, he changed the script again. When he picked up the cup no one is supposed to touch, the cup of redemption. And he said, not only is this the cup of redemption, it's no longer a fruit of the vine. It's no longer wine or juice or whatever you want to call it. This is now my blood. And this blood frees you from the guilt and the stain of your sin. And it'll do the same for all who participate. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit of the vine. So he prepared a meal of sustenance for all of us who came after him. His invitation is for those who earnestly repent, seek to live in peace with him and with one another, and seek to be his hands and feet in this world. If that fits you, you're not only welcome at this table, you're welcome to help serve at this table. Not one of us is worthy. I'm not worthy, I'm not, you're right. Except that he said so. So who would like help serve this morning? Come on down. You don't don't have to be over the age of 34 or anything. There's no requirements. We'll have four stations, four stations, right? Four stations, so we need eight people. There's three. Scott, I think you were, were you going to help or were you going to help set up? Okay, you're going to help set up. So there's four. We need four more. Two more coming. Two more. There they are. See, just like that, we have people step forward and say, here I am, send me. And we're going to send them with the body and blood of Jesus to serve you so that you can receive grace and serve the world. I'll serve you all first, and then I'll hand off the bread so you can serve each other. I'll get you here, Frida. Frida, the body of Christ broken and the blood shed for you. You're welcome. Scott, the body of Christ broken and his blood shed for you. You can take the bread. And the blood shed. Scott's going to instruct his folks and Julie's going to instruct their folks, so I'll instruct you all. We're going to have two stations, actually four stations, but they're both going to be on the, on the wings instead of down the middle. Uh, we also have gluten-free, so if you need gluten-free, just tell the person that has the bread and they can turn around and grab the gluten-free as they go. And if you can't come up at the end, just wave your hand and we'll bring the, the elements to you. We know some people can't ambulate as well. But the table is set. If you all, the two of you could go over there and the two of you over there. Um, the table's set. The invitation's given not by me but by him. And we've been called to come to this table. Jesus wants you to have the grace and the mercy that comes from this meal. So as the Holy Spirit leads your feet, let them move and bring you down.
need the elements brought to them, just wave your hand and we'll bring them over to you. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior. Any of us ever done anything great like our God has? Not without Him. Maybe it's time for us to lean into Him. We're really, really sufficient people. But we're not really as self-sufficient as we think. May the God of the universe fill you through this meal... with enough grace, enough mercy, enough love to overflow and ooze out on the people you come in contact with. May they know beyond the knowledge that they could possibly hold that you're so weird and that the reason is because you're a Jesus freak. I hope and pray people know me as a Jesus freak. In one particular town we were in, somebody commented to one of my parishioners, what does he think, everybody, he's going to bring everybody to Jesus? And my parishioner, I was so proud of her, said, I certainly hope so. But you know, I can't do it alone. And I'm not supposed to do it alone. This community needs Jesus desperately. Amen? Amen. Our neighbors, our co-workers... Our people that serve us at Walmart and Burger King and at restaurants we go to, they need Jesus desperately. We got him. And he's told us to go out and cast our nets. See, we think of Jesus fishing this way, but they didn't fish this way. They fished with nets. So you caught lots of volume fish. What can you do and what can I do to cast the net of the gospel wide so that more and more understand and can respond to the truth of Jesus? He is so, so good to us. Amen? Amen. Let's let him be good to them too. Until all have seen and all have responded, we still have work to do. Father, give us your Holy Spirit so that we might be able to see and empowered to take opportunities to tell others about your Son, Jesus.
Help us to fish like your disciples with a net instead of a pole and line. Help us, God. Help us cast a, a wide net so that your gospel may impact and capture more fish, more men and women. Glory to your name for what you've provided for us. Help us to be instruments of providing that to others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.